The Ramps decided to bury the young hero right there on the spot, just under Buzzard's Roost. No one knows why he got so brave in, front, in the face of them Yankee invaders, but not long after that, the river mysteriously changed course. That small ridge where he had died created a steep embankment on the south side. Ever since that time, people been reporting all sorts of strange happenings and visions around this part of the county. Lizzie and Rady listened intently. Lizzie, now bug-eyed, glanced nervously over her shoulders. Seems like every year, about mid-July or August, somebody will report hearing or seeing some spooky strange thing. Many people have sent, heard him wailing in, on windy nights, and some have even seen him flying around in the sky, all up and down the river, searching out unsuspecting Yankees and chasing them back across the river. Some says he's a lost spirit who will never rest as long as there's Yankees in Georgia. And every year, about the time of the battle, folks report all sorts of unusual sightings. Some have seen campfires blazing through the hillsides as if everybody had come back to fight the war all over again. Yes, Colette piped in. My uncle's even seen him once, a wild white ghost with a hideous scream. He done swooped down out of the sky and took off with three huge catfish they done caught that afternoon. Left a streak of gray hair in Uncle Toby's head. Rady raised an eyebrow at this revelation and glancing at Jenny, soon realized that the original local legend of such quaintness and color had now been transcended by the imaginative libation of the storyteller. Colette, in all sincerity, backing up Jenny's monologue, however, proved most convincing to Lizzie. Approaching dusk, the elements took a punctilious opportunity to blow up a brisk southeastern breeze, and the sun darkened over just a bit as the evening clouds covered the fading sun. Perhaps we should get moving, Liz announced nervously as she jumped up from her resting place and encouraged the movement of the others. It was quite one thing to tolerate heat, Indians, rattlesnakes, mine collapses, wild boars, bears, and mountain lions, but young Liz could muster no defense against a spiritual onslaught. She was anxious to return home, but leery about the river crossing now, as she would be for many years. The South sure is a funny place, she muttered as the party plodded downhill. Angel Brown's farm was about a half mile farther out the Carrollton Road, past the old mine trail, the group was most happy to finally deliver Colette home safe to her mama. She fall into mine? Lord, that child be the death of me yet. Look at you, traipsing off in the woods in your best Sunday go to meetin' dress. Ain't got the sense God gave a mule. Boxing the ear, child on the ear and clamping on to her shoulders, she led the traumatized waif off to the wash house round the side of the small log cabin that was their home. There's work to be done round here, and no need of you gallivanting off in the backwoods looking for trouble. Blackberries are no blackberries. Put you to work scrubbing that pretty dress clean again, and a few other things, and maybe you'll think twice for ruining pretty things again. Thank you, Miss Jenny, for your concern, Miss Brown announced, turning abruptly. I'm sure she'll be fine in a few days. You'd best be getting back home, girl. It seems... It'll soon be dark up this way. Have a drink from the well if you're thirsty. Bless you, children, she instructed as she scuttled the injured party out of sight. Jenny escorted her compatriots back to the ferry and meandered languidly up the grassy path homeward. It was nearly eight o'clock when the tired and dispirited Jenny sauntered into the fence barnyard. Something caught her eye almost instantly. Her heart leaped and palpitated as she examined the wagon parked in back of her house. There in the bed, hanging half out, was the most beautiful yellow rowboat imaginable. Its lean cut sides nicely squared arched upward in a delicate curve. She raced to run her hands over the smooth oak boards and jumped up to sit on the firm wide benches. By this time, the, her father, who had noticed her arrival, the scream was hard to miss, marched out the screen door to see what the ruckus was about. The excited Jenny leaped off the wagon and into the strong arms of her blessed parent. 
Planting a huge kiss right on his left cheek, she begged for an explanation. Yes, it was a boat, a boat that he and Mr. Fouts had, in their spare time, just as a hobby, decided to see if they could build. Now they just needed someone to test it out, as they didn't have time for such foolishness as boating on the Chattahoochee, he asked. Jenny nodded her assent. Well, seeing as how no one else is interested in a boat for the Chattahoochee, I guess you'll just have to keep it until someone does take an interest or finds a need. Oh, Daddy, you're the best, Jenny stated as she kissed him repeatedly. Let's go try it out. Tomorrow, child, tomorrow. I've got a cold supper on the table right now. Where have you been, he demanded. Well, it's a long story, she answered, pausing briefly to decide if confession was the proper course. She admitted inwardly that it was, and proceeded to relate the entire eventful afternoon over a delightful meal. She decided to go to bed right away after soliciting a promise to launch the boat early the next day. Mr. Fouts had given Papa the morning off, and might even stop by himself for a spin. Leaning against the window sill for one last glance at her new boat and the valley stretching beyond, she marveled at the calm appearance of the grounds she knew to be teeming with nocturnal activity. Crickets blazed noisily, the echoes emanating from every corner of the field. The river bottom teemed with notes of a croaking chorus. She remembered an earlier evening sitting at this very sill with her mother. Her admonishment filtered across Jenny's mind. Listen to the voice of the frog. There's a lot of hope there. Indeed, as Jenny listened, she noted an underlying enthusiasm. Mosquitoes darted along the windowsill, and Jenny caught herself rubbing bites on her arms and legs. She turned to hop into bed, but stumbled over something slimy and coarse. Bringing the coal lamp over from the nightstand, she noted a plump, fat toad staring fixedly at her. Poised in an indignant pose, back on his plump haunches, he challenged her supremacy in the room. She rustled him into a corner, captured him, and escorted the invader to the window, where she politely dropped him into a clump of azaleas. Hopefully he would find happiness and contentment there and not return. But just before hopping into bed, she remembered that she had not torn off the calendar sheet on the entry hall, bouncing to it, she found tomorrow's inspirational message was an old New Bedford Seas Seaman's Prayer. Lord help me, my boat is so small and your ocean so large. Hmm, to be sure, she noted, briefly scanning the whaling in gravature before she skipped back to her room. Her bed was a mess because Henry had been jumping in it and now resided comfortably on the cool cotton sheets. What a day, she thought. I have certainly come for full circle. That morning she had been so full of herself, accomplished so much housework, wasted the afternoon swimming and being lazy, and escorted Rady and Liz on quite an adventure. Her discovery at home had banished her tiredness immediately, and she now lay excitedly in her humble room. Again. The day had been a camaraderous conglomeration of wet chickens, a smelly puppy, mosquitoes, Rady in a bright dress off to socialize, fishy hands, panic, and near suffocation in the bowels of the earth. Lizzie's pouting, the aroma of a wonderful meal, the smell of fresh paint, and an ornery toad invading her privacy cascaded across her memory. And tomorrow is another day, she informed Henry as she faded into her dreams.